If you've never heard of Starlux Airlines, you're probably not alone. Starlux is an airline that first flew in 2020 but didn't fly outside of Asia until just last year. With a wonderful boutique cabin and unique customer experience, I'm very excited to try out their game-changing business class on this flight from their Taipei hub out to San Francisco, their newest destination at this time. We'll take a look at their entire customer experience, so use the timestamps to find what you might be looking for. Now off to Taipei. Welcome to Terminal 2 at Taipei's Taoyuan International Airport. Opened in 2000 and home to Taiwan's two largest carriers, China Airlines, Eva Air, and now Starlux. It may be about 9pm, but there's still three flights bound for San Francisco before the end of the day. So we found the one on our airline, and then found the check-in line. Starlux is one of the few airlines offering not only business class, but first class as well. That's a topic for a future video. I spent some time admiring the decorations on the ceiling of Terminal 2's check-in area before finally making my way through security and into the departures area. The terminal here at Taoyuan has a central hub and then two long hallways of gates on either side. The central hub, hosting most of the shops, especially the high-end shops, but we spent most of our money on the ticket and didn't leave cash for anything designer, so instead we began our journey to the lounge, which they did give us a map for at check-in past some traditionally decorated rooms and fun space-themed ceilings, we made our way past a good chunk of the gates as we worked our way down the hallway to find the lounge. Finally, we see Starlux's Galactic Lounge. Still only open for a month or so, and not much out there about it. As business class travelers, we get access included. First class passengers do too, but they can actually get access to the private VIP terminal here in Taipei instead. Now this is where we really got to soak in the space vibe they're going for with this airline. The lounge is giving these space airlock type vibes. There's two levels in the lounge, upstairs being some of the seating, but also the main buffet, some shelves of reading material, and also these lockers, in case you don't want to lug your stuff around with you. Also in the back are the main restrooms. To get food, there's two ways. First off, by scanning the QR code on the table, you can order food to be brought to your table. You can see the menu here with a limited selection, but on top of the buffet, I thought there were some great choices. If you do want to explore the buffet, you'll see a selection of mostly Asian options in steaming dishes or hot plates. The main exception to this is the hot dog roller. Only the second time I've seen a hot dog bar, but the other place being the Delta Sky Club in JFK, which makes a little more sense. Wasn't exactly expecting to see it in Taipei, but I'll welcome it. Other than that, I really liked the large drink fridge and ice cream freezer, including the spread of Asian-style sweets. I grabbed a seat to enjoy some food, but the one thing I do want to mention is that I wasn't able to get shots of the downstairs area, which has some more seating and also two showers. I got on the list for a shower when I checked into the lounge and I was told I was number 9 for a shower. I spent about two to two and a half hours in the lounge and they were never able to clear the waitlist for showers before all the flights departed for the day. This is one of the main critiques I have for this lounge. I don't know exactly how much seating is available downstairs, but they don't point people towards it. The only reason I learned about it was from an article on the lounge. Didn't even know it existed when I was here in person, which is shocking considering the upstairs area was definitely overcrowded. By the time the flights left, every table was full, with nearly every seat full, and it was only two flights worth of passengers in the lounge at this time. I can only imagine that with growth, as they add more flights, this lounge will definitely be too small for what they need. There just isn't enough seating or showers, especially if they're trying to build a good connecting passenger base. Now off to our gate. They told me they would let us know when boarding was ready, but in order to get some footage, I got to the gate about 10 minutes before boarding was supposed to begin. Unfortunately, there was a document check to get into the gate holding area. I got in the line, but it was moving at a snail's pace. While in line, they began boarding. Group 1 was our group, but that came and went. Then Group 2. By the time I actually got through, Group 3 had already been boarding for quite a while. As we made our way down into the gate area, we did at least get a view of our one-year-old A350-900 delivered to Starlux in March of 2023. Then, since I was Group 1, I was able to head right on board and finally see the cabin that I had long wanted to see. Welcome to the absolutely stunning and unique business class cabin of Starlux Airlines' A350s. Attention was paid to every detail, customizing it to fit their brand identity perfectly. 
While there's a couple familiar items in the seats, they have really made it their own. So while everyone else climbs on board, let's look around this seat and stop just talking about it. I gotta say that after all this traveling, it really starts to add up financially. These things aren't cheap, and I do work hard to be able to afford it. But to pull it off, I can also use the help of the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. Plenty of us are familiar with NordVPN and their ability to help us protect against hackers and people with bad intentions that work through internet connections. You might also know them from being able to help you access different content libraries on different streaming services regardless of where you are in the world. One of their biggest perks that I've taken advantage of is their guide helping people get the flights they want at a cheaper price just by setting their location to another country. Come check this out. Here you can see the guide directly on NordVPN's website talking about how to use their services to get a cheaper flight. Things like clearing your cookies, using a VPN, using that specific website, and then comparing the prices at the end. Typically, airlines and flights from developing countries tend to be a little bit cheaper. So we're going to look at a flight on Garuda, Indonesia from Jakarta, Indonesia up to Tokyo, Narita. You can see here the cost without using any VPN. Then, I'm going to use NordVPN to connect to the Indonesian server. This will make it look as if my IP address is in Indonesia. Then I went directly to the airline's website. It thinks I'm in Indonesia. I processed the booking, and it shows a slightly cheaper rate. You'll see it shows in the local currency, which is usually the best way to go. In this case, about $40 cheaper than what we found originally without the VPN. I know that I want to maximize the money that I spend on my travel on top of maximizing my internet security and NordVPN allows me to do all of that. You can too using my link down below nordvpn.com slash Patrick Shea to get four free months on top of a two year plan that you purchase so that you too can browse the internet safely and securely. And with their 30 day money back guarantee you can rest easy knowing that you're safe with your purchase as well. Now back to Taipei. Seat 6A will be mine today. It's a window seat and fortunately all seats are in the same style, so you don't have to worry about differing levels of privacy. The headrest doesn't move which was interesting since that seems like a basic feature these days, but fortunately both the headrest and the seat were insanely comfortable and plenty wide. Over the shoulder is a reading light and below that is some seat shortcuts for some adjustments. Then is the large countertop and enclosed storage. This cubby has to be one of, if not the deepest and largest storage areas I've ever seen in a business class seat that I've come across. I mean, it was like a bottomless pit. I essentially emptied my backpack in there for the flight. For convenience, however, there's also a headset hook, the remote, and assortment of plugs and charging ports. Lastly is a wireless charging pad that charged my phone even faster than my normal charging cable. Just in front of the cubby was the accent light in the seat. It was a fun touch and was dimmable so that it wasn't blinding in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, I only had the one window at my seat, but it is the first time I've ever had the dimmable windows on the A350, so I'm excited to see how it compares to the 787's polarizing windows. The countertop was plenty large, but also had a shallow storage cubby. Not a ton of space, but enough for chargers or amenities. Below that is the main seat adjustments. Not just to move the seat, but to adjust the lighting, windows, and do not disturb settings. Below that is the literature pocket, and another small little cubby that I wished would fit a water bottle, but didn't really fit many useful things of mine. In front of you is obviously the TV, but then is the tray table, which has a little release switch to slide out and can click into a few different detents. Then it can unfold so you can personalize it for the situation nicely. The footrest may not look huge, but I really appreciated the little ledge on the side. In bed mode, it made a huge difference. And while there isn't any under footrest storage, there is this slope to rest your feet on. Along the aisle side, we do have a closing door, but we're going to wait till we get in flight to check that out more. Unfortunately, however, no overhead air vents, just like 90% of A350s these days, which just gets a little bit more frustrating each time. All that put together, however, makes quite possibly the most attractive and most comfortable business class seat that I've ever come across in my travels. As far as the amenities, first off, when we went through the document check at the gate, we were given this little San Francisco luggage tag with Peanuts theme. Maybe a future partnership between Starlux and Peanuts being hinted at. As soon as we sat down, we were also given this glass of green guava juice and a hot towel. Then for the bedding, we were given this pillow, which was a great size, a bit soft for me, but plenty firm for most. 
then the comforter was quite possibly one of the softest comforters I've ever had on an airplane. It wasn't the thickest thing in the world, but it was plush enough that it didn't really matter. We were also given pajamas in a size medium or large. Inside the bag was a long sleeve shirt and pants, both of which were super comfortable, soft, and thicker than most airline pajamas. So comfortable, in fact, I even brought them home and have used them since. We were also given a refreshing face mask with the pajamas to help get ready for sleep, along with this garment bag with slippers. After that, they handed out bottles of water for everyone and then the headphones which came in this little case. It was fun that the headphones were Starlux branded, but more important is that they were some of the most comfortable headphones I've ever used, and if you switched on the active noise reduction on one of the ear cups, it's quite possibly the best noise cancellation I've ever had. On top of all of that, the ear cups are deep enough that there isn't constant pressure on your ear, so it was no problem if you fell asleep with them on. Lastly was the amenity kits. It was a nice kit with a sturdy case, kind of reminds me of a better looking version of United's away amenity kits. Inside was some of the normal stuff like eye mask, earplugs, socks, dental kit, hairbrush, then some nice amenities from a French cosmetic company. Now many of you have probably heard of an airline called Eva Air, another Taiwanese carrier. In 2016, the former CEO and chairman of Eva Air registered the Starlux brand with the Taiwanese government. The story goes that not only was this man the head of Eva Air, but his father was the founder of Evergreen Shipping Group, the parent company of Eva Air. After the death of his father, his half-siblings fired him from his CEO role at Eva Air, and from there he set out to build a rival carrier, which would become the first new Taiwanese carrier in 30 years, while the rest of us sat by to see how the new airline and of course the drama would unfold. We can see the amount of care that he's put into this airline to try and perfect it. For starters, he wants to inspect and fly every new aircraft coming to the airline, which he's able to do as a pilot himself. These aircraft, by the way, have cabins designed by BMW, venues designed by Michelin chefs. He's also put a ton of effort into making the experience unique. With a name like Starlux, the space theme runs through each phase of the customer experience, to the point that the seats on board are unique, not just standard seats with their logo on it like most carriers do. The original launch was planned for late 2019, but was later pushed to early 2020 with the first flight being to Macau during Chinese New Year. And in case performance was an issue, with all the anticipation of this new airline, seats for the first flight sold out in 11 minutes. Their goal is to become the world's best airline, obviously, but with more of a boutique feel. They've stated the goal to be the Emirates of East Asia in terms of opulence, focusing on the wealthier business and vacation travelers. Looking at the world's new airlines, a lot of them are focusing on the low-cost market, assuming that passengers will choose the best price over anything else. Starlux wants to fill the void in the high-end market that no one else is really going after, allowing them to attract the travelers who will pay a little more for some extra luxury, which doesn't work on every route, but there's certainly a few where airlines can cash in. In March 2019, Starlux placed the largest Airbus deal in Taiwan's history, which has since contributed to them holding the Youngest Fleet Award for a couple years as they hold all new airplanes. Once they had aircraft in place, they announced the first three destinations would be Macau, Da Nang, and Penang. And in October of that year, the CEO himself flew the first Starlux aircraft, an A321neo, from Hamburg back to Taipei via Dubai and Bangkok. Once arrived, the airline was able to show off the execution of their vision, with the specifically designed cabins and uniforms, in addition to a signature perfume, which was to be used in lounges and cabins as well as on scented towels. After their very successful launch in January 2020, however, they received the title of unluckiest airline after COVID forced them to suspend routes only two months in. They were able to resume Da Nang flights after not too long, and then added a couple more destinations a month or so later. They received their certification for Japanese flights mid-pandemic and FAA certification for US flights shortly after in 2021. In 2023, they announced Los Angeles would be their first US destination and also announced their partnership with Alaska Airlines based on the US West Coast with a sizable domestic network. I'm curious to see where their growth takes them, but right now I'm happy just to have this product at my home airport.
After departure, we were handed our wine and food menus and they took our orders. I do want to take a look at them, but first our doors were unlocked and we got them shut. You'll notice that they're still leaving some gaps above, below, and to the side. It definitely helps with sleep, but in general, I didn't feel like it added too much more privacy. The wine list showed wines from Europe, Australia, and South America, which is an interesting choice considering those are the only continents they don't fly to, besides Antarctica, obviously. The food began by introducing the Michelin star chefs that created the special plates on the menu. Then was the two choices for the dinner, either the star gourmet, more of an Asian style designed by Chef Kin, the other was the international menu consisting of more Western options. Then was the listing of mid-flight snacks and beverages, of which I was happy to enjoy later on in this journey. And then the last meal, which was more of a breakfast option. Strange, since it'll be breakfast time in Taipei, but definitely dinner time in San Francisco. Then is the listing of the rest of the drinks, starting with the alcohol options including their signature drinks. This was followed by the non-alcoholic options, then a full page of tea options, and then the last page with fresh pressed juices. As for the entertainment, they have a freshly designed Seatback entertainment system with some nice options. The best selection was definitely the movies, I just wish you could sort by genres and languages, but with only one or the other you can see some of the options available here. There actually wasn't many TV shows, some strange options overall and only like one or two episodes of each show. At least we could add things to favorites from movies and shows to access them easier later on. We could also see the full listings for the food, beverage, and duty-free listings on board. Getting to the map was super easy up top where you could pull up the flight info for a quick glance, or you could expand that into the full map. I was also very pleased to have Bluetooth connectivity, although their headphones honestly were better than the ones that I had, so I ended up not using it. Lastly, they do have Wi-Fi on board these aircraft. You can purchase plans with limited data, but if you're in first or business class, you'll get free Wi-Fi for the full flight by just logging in with your ticket information and then clicking the button to connect. After that, the speeds really aren't that bad. I was able to load everything except streaming, which was totally fine for me on this flight. Then it was time for our dinner service, and let me just say that long gone are the days of crummy airline food at least in Asia. For starters, I had the red caviar with seaweed, a sunchoke soup with maitake and scallions, along with an octopus salad with fennel and apple vinaigrette. To go with that, I got their signature drink, the Sci-Fi Cosmos 2.0, which was a gin and tonic with blue curacao and lactic acid essentially. Not my favorite tasting, but it does look cool. I just gotta stop getting gin drinks for myself. I also couldn't help but admire the silverware, which was branded but also had the sort of space design look to its shape. Then for the main course, it was duck with white beans and a red wine mustard sauce. It was honestly one of the best cooked meats I've ever had on an airplane. Then to wrap it up for dessert, we got a passion fruit jingguan tea and sea salt milk gelatos alongside a general fruit plate, a little chocolate, and then the tea that I chose to go with. I cannot think of another meal I've had on an airplane that rivals this one off the top of my head, and I've had some great meals at this point, so huge props to the chefs at Starlux. After all that great food, it was time for bed. The crew brought over another hot towel after the meal and then offered a turndown service and also brought over a mattress pad. It wasn't necessarily the thickest one ever, but it did cover the gaps and lumps and at least the seat itself was super comfortable. Then by adding the comforter and pillow, you can make a pretty darn comfortable bed. If you want to make it even better, however, you can lower the armrest and make an even wider surface as well. The footwell was great for sleep too. It was plenty deep, tall, and wide. I found it easy to sleep in any position. Then I used the seat panel to engage the do not disturb mode and shut my door for sleep where I was able to sleep for about 6 hours until my alarm went off. Truth be told though, I could have slept the rest of the flight. By the time I woke up, the sun had completely risen as it was basically the middle of the day. Weren't able to tell by looking out the windows which were locked at full dim, so all we could see was a little bit of a purple tint. Then I wanted to enjoy their mid-flight snacks, so I got both of them. The Taiwanese noodle soup with chicken and prawns was pretty good but the burger was the star of the show. 
The Wagyu beef patty in the pineapple bun with truffle butter was so good, I could have gone back for seconds, thirds, fourths, you name it. Then looking around the lavatory of this beautiful aircraft, they did add their design to the wall, which was a nice touch. Other than that, the surfaces were fairly normal, but I did appreciate the amenities. There was toothpicks, mouthwash, and towels in the container next to the face mist and hand lotion. To really set the vibe, in addition to the Starlux branded toilet paper, they also had their signature scent, and like a calming soundtrack with a babbling brook playing through the speaker. I did take a look at the empty first class seats on our flight. The seats themselves looked nice, but not too much different from our seats besides the floor to ceiling walls and maybe a little more space so I'd assume the value comes largely in the experience. We do know that you get to use the private terminal in Los Angeles and Taipei at least, so I wonder what added benefits you'd get on board. I guess we'll tab that for the future. Then it was time for the pre-arrival meal, which was served about three hours before departure, which seemed a little early, at least earlier than average. They brought over another cup of that green guava juice, and then to start, I chose to go with a few things, including the pumpkin salad, plain yogurt, and a selection of bread. Then the main course was this cinnamon polenta with berries and a raisin pear maple syrup. Absolutely delicious. Another seasonal fruit plate signified the end of this meal service as well. Then to wrap it up, we were given another hot towel and a bottle of water in preparation for descent. Then the windows were finally unlocked, and I was able to try out the window dimming on the A350's dimmable windows. You'll see that you can hit the dim or bright window to raise or lower the setting, and then it shows the progress as it adjusts to that setting. In my opinion, it seems to go much faster than the 787's windows, and at least you know how far it's gone through its progress. Then the last thing we were given was these little sweets. One was a mint, one was a gummy. In their short history, Starlux still hasn't posted a profit, which is somewhat normal for an airline of this age, but they do have some of the makings for a future success. As far as I can tell, 2022 only saw a 35% load factor for the airline, which is horrendously low. Fortunately, it seems like their 2023 went far better, and 2024 is on pace to be even better than that. So I guess we sit back and wait for those performance numbers. Let's also not forget they have the youngest fleet in the world, which keeps people coming back to them, but also keeps them with the most efficient fleet. Currently, they have 13 A321 NEOs for their medium haul Asian routes, 4 A330 NEOs for their long haul Asian routes with 7 more on order, and 5 A350s for ultra long haul flights and the highest density routes with 6 more of the 900 variants and 8 1000 variants on order. At this time, Starlux isn't in any airline alliance, but this partnership with Alaska Airlines does allow them to try and corner a good part of the US to Asia market. Now I say it's their only airline partner because in 2023 they launched their partnership with the Los Angeles flights, announcing partnerships with the Los Angeles Clippers and Dodgers sports teams. You see teams rocking gear or ads from airlines, but rarely do you see airlines repping the sports teams. I am interested to see if they secure any more airline partners, either interline partnerships or an actual alliance, which could be interesting since Taipei has a Sky Team and Star Alliance partner, but no One World partner. So maybe if the Alaska Airlines partnership goes well, we'll see that in the future. It looks like the Los Angeles route has been operating fairly well as there's a good amount of business but also a large tourism market both ways between Asia and Los Angeles. Personally, I was excited when they announced service to my home airport of San Francisco not long after Los Angeles. San Francisco has one of, if not the largest market between North America and East Asia with cultural and economic ties. Specifically, San Francisco and Taipei have an absolutely ginormous point-to-point -point market. Between the two cities, there are now eight, soon to be nine flights every day. Its largest destination in Asia and second largest international destination behind only London Heathrow. Eva Air with three flights, China Airlines with two flights, United with two, and now Starlux with one. And that doesn't include cargo or charter flights, which see multiple per day as well. So it makes sense that this was one of Starlux's main targets in North America. The expansion doesn't end there, however, as literally while I was on board this flight, Starlux announced their intentions of a Taipei to Seattle route. 
which would be an interesting one since there's definitely a demand between the two cities but will most likely exist to draw in passengers connecting on Alaska Airlines, as Seattle is their largest hub. Honestly, they have a bit of a niche market as they want to cater to the luxury markets, so they won't fit in everywhere. I think they've got a good foundation but might be hurt with growing too fast if they continue to add destinations. I do know the CEO has said they're more focused on North America than Europe at this time, at least with San Francisco and Los Angeles being their, their only two current destinations outside of East Asia. Honestly, I felt like it was bold for them to launch a third national airline for a country that's 134th ranked globally by size and 57th by population. But Starlux seems to be working their way into the puzzle. Last year, Eva Air carried 10.5 million passengers. China Airlines with 8.5 million, Starlux was third place with 3 million. Not too bad if you compare the size of those three airlines, and if you look at people's reflection on the experience, it seems like most people prefer Starlux, meaning they'll probably bring back repeat customers. They definitely executed the space vibe, making everything a spectacle from their website to the airport experience, the cabin, and even the cutlery and salt shakers, and their call sign with air traffic control being Starwalker. Keep doing you, Starlux. I'm just glad to be on board. As with the rest of the world, I've been anxiously awaiting my first Starlux flight. I'd read all the headlines, seen all the promotional advertisements, and I was extremely excited to see if it lived up to the hype. My first impressions were once I got to the airport. The Taipei Taoyuan Airport isn't the most flashy. I was expecting some sort of intricate, enclosed, or decorated check-in area from Starlux, or at least for their premium class passengers, so I guess that was kind of a letdown, but oh well. I was also a bit surprised that there wasn't any sort of priority security or immigration. Other than a shorter check-in line, there really wasn't all that much special about the experience that far. Then it was time for the lounge. Lounges really allow airlines to set themselves apart. First off, I absolutely love that they've stuck with their space theme with the Galactic Lounge and Starwalker call sign. The lounge's details were perfect, matching the brand exactly as they imagined. The only thing I have to say is that it is so dang small. If they're going to grow anymore, they'll outgrow that space, as even the two flights to San Francisco and Los Angeles had the lounge at capacity, and an hour and a half wait for a shower. The boarding was a bit chaotic, only because we weren't exactly made aware of the document check, so I left the lounge 10 minutes before boarding and still ended up boarding at the end of group 3. Now, if I'm being a bit harsh, that all ends there, because the cabin and onboard product made up for every single thing wrong with the airport that missed the mark. The design of the seat was absolutely gorgeous, and you can truly tell there was an attention to every single little detail. I mean, most airlines slap a reverse herringbone setup in their fleet with their colors on it and call it a day. These seats, at least for the moment, cannot be duplicated, and honestly probably won't be duplicated solely because their design is perfect to fit the Starlux brand, and honestly wouldn't work as well in other aircraft. As for the soft product, all of the amenities were excellent. Great quality amenity kits, great quality bedding, the best pajamas I've ever had in the sky, and that's not even including the food, honestly some of the best airplane food I've ever had. All designed by Michelin chefs, the flavor in every bite was well thought out. Much better than your typical North American or European airline meal. On top of this, the staff was some of the most amazing people I've ever met. Hospitality comes to the forefront in Asian culture and it showed through with Starlux. From check-in to deplaning, I do know that the purser was from Singapore Airlines and most crew came from other airlines as well, including apparently a single Delta crew. Seems like they were trained well. So you know what I think about it, but without talking about the price, it's a somewhat moot point. San Francisco to Taipei is one of the world's busier air routes for point-to-point -point business travelers. 
As such, it's not the cheapest, with business class round trip for just over $5,000. Starlux is right in the mix with the other three carriers, however. The main thing that's going to hold them back is that United, Eva, and China Airlines all have fairly big followings. Their customers, especially business customers, have flown with them fairly allegiantly for quite a while, so Starlux will have to work to get some of that customer base. What they do have in their favor is being the only carrier to offer first class on this route. For $14,000 round trip, you can get one of the four first class suites. Visually, they didn't seem worth it, but you do get the VIP terminal in Taipei, although I'm not sure exactly what you get if you're departing from SFO. So for now at least, we're left wondering what's involved and hoping that we can try it out one day. I for one am a big fan of Starlux's business class and hopefully a repeat customer. Let me know your thoughts though, and until next Sunday, safe travels, I will see y'all next time.